pay you, so thank you for coming. Let me just wait until some folks have a chance to sit. How about the food? Wasn't that good? Yeah. Thank you very much, Cassie, for, um, for feeding us. That is one way to get people to come to your event, is to feed them, <laughs> um, especially Korean food. Um, so welcome, everybody. My name is Susan Jen Davis. I am a good friend of KU, and it is really an honor for me to be an MC tonight at this fundraiser and at this event to support and to honor our good friend Kay. Uh, now, you know that Kay is qualified, right? <laughs> you know, right? I mean, in fact, she's overqualified. She's a hard worker and she's overachieving. I mean, she's Korean for God's sake. <laughs> we are a very vigorous people. <laughs> but what I think makes Kay especially special or three things about Kay. The first is, I'm not sure you all know this because I didn't see it on her bio, but Kay is an elite athlete. I'm not sure you know that. No. She, she, wait, no, you're always an athlete. She was an ultra marathoner and she has done many Ironman competitions. Wow. Okay? And yeah. I, 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 but in all seriousness, if you don't know what it takes to be such an athlete, you need to understand from someone who is not such an athlete. I'm going to run the Broad Street Run, the 10 miler, badly next week. you has run many such races that are up to like 50, 100 miles. And I think that I, I can say that David Kim, he knows what it's like when you have to dig down deep, really hard, with, with grit and with mental strength to get through a very amazing physical feat. Because as a musician, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And I think that what one thing about Kay is that she has sheer determination. She has incredible mind over body strength. And I think that that Winston Churchill summed it up best. Kay will never, ever, 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 ever give up for us. Secondly, Kay is an immigrant, all right? <coughs> the celebrated Asian American author and poet Ocean Vuong said that the most creative and innovative people in the world are immigrants. Mm -hmm because they have to reinvent themselves. They have determination. They have grit and resilience. And so what you get with Kay is that immigrant strength. But more importantly, what you get from Kay is that she never forgets who she is and from where she comes from. We need that kind of person to be our judge. And finally, I would say, Kay understands what it's like to be in the margins of this society. Okay? She was given nothing but the enduring love of her mother who brought her up and gave up everything for her and sadly did not see Kay to the level of success that she has achieved to this day. But I know she's looking down on her. And she is a warrior for equity and justice in everything that she has done. She argued for her own citizenship. She fought against being taken away from this country after coming here after great hardship. She was almost deported. For her entire career, she has fought for others. She has been there for us and she has been a warrior for equity and justice. Now it's our time to give back to, to Kay. And we thank you so much for being here. And we hope that you will continue to talk about Kay, vote for Kay, and get others to be enlisted in the movement to have Kay you elected as a Korean American judge in the state of Pennsylvania. So thank you for being here. Now I'd like to introduce my great cohort here. Jimmy Chong, who will continue the program. Thank you. That was very well said. Um, so it's going to be tough to follow up with that.
But I just like to say it's an honor to be here, um, especially sitting next to Susan, just next to someone such magnitude. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and also to be here tonight uh, to help support KU. Uh, just a little bit about my experience with her. I, I met her as a very young attorney when I uh, you know, moved into the Philadelphia area. And Kay was there to help mentor me and other young attorneys. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know anything about me except that everything was new. And she was there every step of the way. She always made herself available. And that just, just how genuine and how authentic she is. And that's why I'm here tonight to support her. She's done this through her whole career. Uh, she was the chair of the HRC in Philadelphia and she would fight for uh, you know, the people that were other minorities, other people that were going through struggles. Um, and that's what Kay is. Kay is a fighter. Kay doesn't give up. Uh, she has a goal that she sets and she gets there and she does it without compromising uh, her values. And that's why I think she has the perfect temperament to be a judge. And we all, you know, if you're here in Philadelphia and you can vote for her, we have to vote for her and for her to become the first Korean American uh, court of common pleas judge in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would be amazing and she's going to set history. So yeah. I am just, it's an honor. So thank you, Kay, for letting me be uh, a part of this. So tonight, um, it couldn't happen without uh, the host committee. Um, and uh, Susan here is uh, a part of that, myself, and uh, a couple other people that uh, we'd like to thank. Um, Deborah Hong, Ken Yang, John Chow, Teresa Wallace, Carol Wong, Edward Kung, Marcia Kung, James Kim, the Korean American Association of Greater Philadelphia, Brad Baldia, Susanna Fu, Connie Kirker, Andy Toy, John Chin, Simon Shim, Sharon Hartz, Su Jin Kim, and Jane Cook. Let's give a hand for them. So um, I'd like to uh, also had the privilege to introduce uh, Ken Yang. He is the CEO of Posse, and uh, without him, this couldn't be possible. So Ken, if you could come up here. Sure, well, thank you, Jimmy, but uh, Please let me correct you, it's really my privilege and honor for PASI and Evergreen Center to be able to serve as the site for this fundraiser for KU. I think that Jimmy and uh, the great Ms. Jen Davis shared so much about Kay's legal skills and her heart for the community. So let me just share briefly about what I know of Kay. And I can think of two words, virtuosity and generosity. Jimmy and, and Ms. Jim Davis shared about her virtuosity, the great skills, the temperament that she, we know she will bring to the Court of Common Pleas. I'll share about her generosity. We're meeting here at Evergreen Center at PASI uh, for, for many reasons, I think. But one of them is because Kay served on Penn Agent Senior Services Board. She was one of our original board members. And you might imagine she was just as busy back then as she is now. But she joined PASI, she joined our, our, our founder, Inja Choi, and I was just sharing with some of our esteemed guests that the uh, Policies and Procedures Manual that we currently use was created by Kay. So that is, that is Kay in a nutshell. Never too busy to give back to the community, never too busy to, to give back to uh, a little nonprofit like PASI. So uh, again, it's an honor to be able to share some remarks about Kay. And it's also an honor to be able to welcome Ms. Deborah Hong to the stage.
thank you, Kay, for this event and giving me the opportunity to share why I'm in support of her candidacy. So Kay and I, we met in 2009, um, and I love sharing the story of how we met because I think it's quintessentially who Kay is. I mean, she knows how to reach deep into the community and find you and get to know you and connect with you. Um, she was serving as president of APAVA, Pennsylvania at the time. That's the Asian Lawyers Association um, in Pennsylvania. And she was on a mission to find every single local Philadelphia Asian lawyer that wasn't involved and <laughs> get them engaged and get them to roll up their sleeves and to participate. And so she found me. Um, and I think you, you, you Googled and internet searched for all of us and found us. And I called it internet stalking. Stalked us. She, she stalked. <laughs> she called me up, uh, took me out to lunch, and then within a year I was serving on like five committees and <laughs> on the board of the PAVA PA and um, like president within the next year. <laughs> so it was so much more though than just a PAVA PA our work together um, that you ignited. Um, you know, just the conversations we had, this, the, the discourse on social policy, remember we'd sit in our cars and debate, you know, I leaned heavily right at the time actually, and um, now lean with Kay. <laughs> and you were very much influential in that. Um, you know, you just are just thoughtful pragmatic, not judgmental, but very, you're an active listener. You're very deliberate um, with, with your work. And it's something that um, I think shows and you know, helps multiply in the work that people who you touch do. Um, I can't think of a bigger champion and role model in my career. I have much to owe to Kay um, for the path and the vector that I have been on. She's been there all the way to support me. So. I do know that she is um, fiercely committed to her community. She has been engaged, she has a track record, and um, uh, just very committed to following the rule of law and someone that we could really use on the bench. So thank you for your service and for helping all of us to get engaged, and good luck, and we look forward to seeing you on the bench. <laughs> Just um, frankly, I am just so touched to be here this evening in support of my friend, and so proud of um, all that she has accomplished to this point. But even more so about what she is about to accomplish. And um, I don't want to jinx it, but <laughs> there is uh, enormous work to be done in this city, and I just can't think of a better person to. Uh, Join the, the upper echelon of all the important people that you know are just diving in head first, fearless rather, you know. And so um, I just thought we would take just a few minutes tonight and uh, do a little Q and A, a little bit of discussion, and perhaps get to know Kay a little bit deeper. Um, I know that uh, it's been a long journey for you. Uh, you came here from your native Korea, uh, very young, and then uh, Seattle, and then, you know, we could go on and on, you know, New York, and then Georgetown Law, and then, uh, and then you came to Philadelphia about the same time I did, late 1990s, kind of early, two, well, 1998? 1999. 99. I think the same year as you. That was my first year in the orchestra, and so, um, I mean, if here we are 
in this uh, kind of um, iconic area, Old York Road, and um, a lot of our fellow Koreans live and work kind of north of here. And what, what does this city, Philadelphia, mean to you? Yeah. Um, so first of all, before I get into the answer, David, I cannot thank you enough for being here with us and being here to support my candidacy. Um, it is tremendous. You've been incredibly generous, and I um, am so grateful to you. It's completely my pleasure and privilege to be here and in support of your candidacy. So Philadelphia, um, yeah, so it's definitely home. Uh, you all who are born and raised. I wish I could say I was born and raised because it is definitely, I've never lived anywhere longer than I have lived here in Philadelphia. I'm committed to the city and to the Commonwealth. Um, and even though I cannot say that I'm born and raised, I can. I feel like I've been adopted. <laughs> and it is um, a place where I feel very, very connected um, to our democracy, the birthplace of our democracy. It's a place and across the nation where we need to fight to preserve this de democratic process. Um, and uh, there's no better place that I can think of to be partaking in that than in, like I said, the birthplace of our democracy and in a very, very swingy state. So what we do here really matters. <laughs> Uh, you were uh, a very important part of the Biden-Harris campaign in 2020. Could you just give us the Reader's Digest version of how intense that moment was for you and how it might have kind of helped inform your, uh, your person and um, maybe uh, adjust your value system and maybe there were moments you didn't feel quite safe I mean, just tell us the inside story of what that experience was like. Yeah, I gotta say that, um, you know, I, I was literally disenfranchised. Um, I was out of status. Um, I did FM deportation notices for me and my entire family when I was about 10 years old. I'm not sure how it is that we stayed, um, but we did. And I feel like the fact that I was able to um, become a naturalized citizen uh, is pretty miraculous. And it's sad for me that it takes a miracle um, for that to happen. Um, but being disenfranchised, um, you know, when I became naturalized, I voted in every election since then, in 1993. 1993, the same year I graduated law school. So I've been a lawyer as long as I've been <laughs> a citizen. Um, but it took me a really long time to understand how hard it is to do democracy at all. Like we, we're not at the point where we're trying to do it well yet. Hopefully we'll get there, but let's you know keep it alive here. Um, but it really took me a long time. Um, I had to fight against um, being able to blame others for who was running government. It took me a really long time to understand that we have the government that we invest in ourselves, that we participate in, and a democratic process is literally that. It takes us to vote as the fundamental thing that we do. And we don't do it as much as we need to um, in, as, in the numbers that we need to, especially given that we have elections that happen every six months in Pennsylvania. And in the odd years, um, the odd years are, the, are really important. The odd years are when we decide who runs our local government. The odd years are when we decide who's going to be our judges. And turnout is pretty abysmal. Maybe I'll be um, uh, proven wrong on May 16th. Words of people will come out and vote. There is so much that we need to decide. Um, everybody knows all of that. Um, but it took me a really long time to understand how hard we have to work to make democracy happen. 
Um, and it really did culminate in 2020. And that 13 months that I was the voter protection director, um, it's the most meaningful work that I have ever done in my career, in the 30 years that I've been an attorney. Um, it was grueling, it was important, it was stressful. Um, and then if you think back into that year, um, we had a global pandemic upon us. We had George Floyd's murder and the civil unrest that came. We had completely new election laws and we had an electorate that had to learn how to use a mail-in ballot. Thank goodness we had that, but we all had to learn how to do that and then do it in a way that wasn't going to invalidate it. <laughs> there are just so many mistakes that can be made that will cancel out a vote that a voter casts. And that was the work that we did in 2020, was to make sure that every communication that was went out on behalf of Democratic candidates um, from the presidential election all the way down to all of the down ballot races was accurate and set, actually would explain to, to voters um, how to cast a ballot. We trained lots of people. <laughs> we trained so many people. Um, and I'm gonna give a shout out to my campaign manager, Rachel Tate, who's in the back there. Uh, she was my second. Um, she was my second hire. Uh, she was, uh, she ran our hotline, um, fielded what, 70, 76, Seventy four thousand. I was over counting. Only seventy four thousand calls completed on that that hotline, um, which, by the way, um, pr provided answers in Spanish because Rachel is also fluent in Spanish. So, um, you know, those kinds of things were really, really important. Um, we had seventeen thousand attendees in the um, Zoom trainings that we had. Uh, that's a lot of people. Um, we were doing trainings where we had 1,400 people at a time on a Zoom. We learned that if we, uh, if we wait until the time of the event and then open the Zoom and let people in, we will all crash our computers. <laughs> so, fortunately, there were enough of us uh, uh, on the team um, that somebody was still left there on the Zoom and we didn't all crash at once, right? So we could come back on and then try to get started. Um, but uh, that's why we, we got a whole, like, I gotta tell you, people, people really enjoyed our Zoom uh, trainings. Uh, not only were we providing really essential information that they would then share with others about how to, how to cast a, a ballot that was gonna count, um, but we had really good music playing for the 25 minutes that we had the Zoom open so that we could gradually let people in and not crash the Zoom, so. So, um, so now you're in this campaign and let's just call it like it is. You are the front runner right now. <clears throat> you have the most number of <laughs> There is uh, excitement, there's momentum, there's chemistry happening. And so, um, and yet, a campaign is a campaign. So, how do you deal with criticism? Are you, are you thin-skinned? Are you, are you uh, thick-skinned? Do you just, do you understand the, the nature of this beast, which is democracy, that you just have to go through that in the crucible? Or is it actually something that you've uh, had to struggle with? It's, oh, wait a minute, where do I start? Uh, it's, it's a long process um, that is complicated and has uh, many layers and um, understanding what's going on, it, it takes, takes a lot to get there. And I believe that the reason that we are doing so well right now is that I ran once before and I ran in 2019 and um, there are special rules that apply to judicial candidates. Um, it makes it even harder. <laughs> uh, 
Um, we can't exist, but between the, okay, again, state, um, state judges are elected in odd years, right? And so you can only be a judicial candidate starting the, the day after the general election the year before. So I've been a judicial candidate since November 8th of 2022. And, um, and in Philadelphia, it's the primary that really makes the determining um, decisions. Actually, for the Court of Common Pleas, there are 10 vacancies and not a single Republican candidate has, has filed um, for any of the 10 um, common pleas seats. Uh, so it will be determinative um, in May. Um, that's a really short period of time <laughs> to do everything that you need to do as a judicial candidate. Um, so I like to, to think of this campaign as having started in 2018 when I launched my judicial campaign for 2019, and then really just my participation in civic engagement just kept growing after that. Um, and I will just mention that, uh, you know, I'm so proud of the, the campaign that my team ran. And I see Ray, Raymond John is in, in the room. <laughs> If you all want to go and like see a really fabulous website, come go, go to caperjudge.com. And that is a website that um, Raymond created. And I still go there and I'm like, websites can do this? I have no idea. Um, so it is, um, it is a fabulous place. You can see my now up to, I think we're up to 56 endorsements. I have an endorsement page, so we have um, all the, the logos there. It's a fun visual. Uh, representation and um, you know it it has been um, something that I've decided this time around um, yeah we're running strong we're built on what we started in 2018 2019 um, the work that we did in 2020 really really impacted people and I think that's all the reason why we're, we're running so strong right now so when we first met, you came over to the Kimmel Center, just to, when we first met to start planning this event this evening, you came to the Kimmel Center, we had breakfast, and I think I asked you something like, oh well, what have you tweaked for this campaign as opposed to the previous one, where you were not successful? And you said something that I found um, very touching, and that was that you quickly realized that the fact that you could not speak Korean or even understand Korean was a detriment to your campaign. And so I'm going to test you because you said, <laughs> no, I, you know, I've watched some K dramas. You know. uh, believe me, this is like the blind leading the blind because I was. I wasn't even born in Korea. I was born in Illinois, and. Um, but both of us kind of had those tiger moms. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, 한국인으로서 어떻게 앞으로 한국 한국 분들하고 어떻게 커넥션을 어떻게 만들 거예요? I just asked her like her uh, like how she plans on making connection with Philadelphia-based like Korean people like us. <laughs> <laughs> so, Korean language is really, really um, has a it touches my heart a lot because it's something I really associate with my mom. Um, she was the one I spoke Korean with, and um, in college, um, a couple of years before she passed away, I took this Korean class, and I did not realize that at that point my language skills were, were like really good but you know korean shame right you're never good enough so i didn't i didn't feel it i didn't realize it um and uh it was funny because i i was the only one who wasn't a fluent korean speaker in that class because all the koreans they were there they were there for the easy eight right and they, i'm like looking at them going why are you in this class and they were looking at me going why are you in this class and I'm like, because 
Um, so my mom passed away in 1985. And that was a really long time ago. And she was the one I spoke with. And in 2019, I had so much support from the Korean community, and I would go out and meet folks. But it became very, very, very clear to me that I lost all of my Korean language to the point where I couldn't understand. This is, this is hurt me so much. I couldn't understand a, a word. Um, but uh, speaking of K dramas. <laughs> You know, um, after 2020, um, in 2021, I decided that I would tend to my personal life a little bit um, and watch a lot of Korean dramas, right? Um, but then it was an opportunity to study a little bit and do a little more. Uh, <laughs> David was very encouraging, and he said, She's just saying that it's just uh, amazing that she just studied Korean and now here she is and she's <laughs> speaking in public. It's just amazing. <laughs> so, so <laughs> oh, well, David, let me ask you. you. You've been in Philadelphia as long as I know, and it is a great pride and joy to all of us Koreans that you lead the Philadelphia Orchestra. you want to stay? What makes you stay in Philadelphia? <laughs> well, uh, for those of you who may not be fans of classical music or the orchestra, the Philadelphia Orchestra is considered one of the great orchestras of the United States. <laughs> so there ain't nowhere for me to go. <laughs> I've reached the pinnacle of my career and this is it. And um, it has been an incredible journey to be here for 24 years. I've seen the world, I've traveled all over the world with the orchestra, and both of my daughters were born on the main line here in Philadelphia. Uh, my wife and I love this place, and um, several years ago, the orchestra filed for bankruptcy protection. Um, and at that point, uh, a lot of orchestras contacted me from around the U.S. asking me if I might, in fact, a, a couple of schools and orchestras in Korea also contacted me and asked if I might be interested in jumping ship. And I kind of, you know, I was feeling kind of like, well, I might have to do that because the orchestra, you never know what's gonna happen. They file for bankruptcy and, uh, and then I asked my wife and she just looked at me. She didn't grow up here, but we love it here. And she said, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> really? And so um, I realized pretty quickly that this is it for me. And our girls love it here. Um, and one is in school in Washington, D.C. But she says, oh yeah, I'll be living on the main line someday. And my older one is, I uh, went to Swarthmore and then we'll be going to grad school here at Penn, you know, so she's gonna be here. And so we just love this community. And that's partly why I am extra proud to support your candidacy and just to see um, how focused you are on the goal. And uh, I thought maybe I, I actually brought my three point five million dollar violin. <laughs> I thought maybe I'll play with something yeah. for you. Without playing for us. I have to play for my team pup. <laughs> so I just had one question that I as we were driving as I was driving up here, I was just like, what can I ask Kay kind of like to be very presumptuous? Like 
I don't want to jinx anything, but okay. So you, let's say hypothetically that you will be on the bench and as you told me, it's a 10 year position. And um, what could you say to your wonderful, passionate constituents here, how you would approach, say your first year, and then perhaps after five years, how you see um, your work, and then perhaps even your legacy. So the current work that I do now, um, I'm an arbitrator and mediator. Uh, so as an arbitrator, I decide cases uh, that come before me. And as a mediator, I help uh, parties get to a negotiated settlement. Essentially, this is the work of a judge. So I'm already doing that um, now. I am a public servant at heart, which is um, why I'm running again. And I want to be a judge for the people. In the first year, I know I have a lot to learn because, you know, in court administration, um, in di you dealing with different types of cases. Um, yeah, I don't know where I'll be assigned yet, um, but got to win the election first and then deal with the assignment later. Or oh, it could be anywhere in the state of Pennsylvania. Oh no, um, it could be in family court. It could be uh, right. in but uh, within criminal court. Philadelphia proper. Yes. But I don't know what the area will be. Um, but I think that there can there is a lot of work that can be done to make um, the court system more efficient. There's work that can be done to make it serve the public. And how court administration happens is something that someone who is brand new will not know. So I will have a lot to learn. I will um, be a team player. I then will also hopefully lend um, my own compassion and humanity in um, making whatever positive changes that we can. So that's sort of what I would like to do over the course of the next few years after that. And um, hey, you know, I, being part of a functioning democracy requires uh, three branches of co government that are independently functioning and then functioning together. And, you know, I just wanted to find the place where I could um, serve the most and the best. And so um, here we are. And I love actually talking to voters. And there's no better opportunity to do that than as a candidate. So um, we'll be out there talking to, to folks as much as possible. And I'm just going to mention this too. Um, there, there aren't very many. It's, it's hard to do language access. It's very, it's very hard. Um, I think that we were very successful in 2020 in Spanish language, but we were not successful in any other language. Um, and I'm doing um, a little bit to provide information to um, voters who speak different languages. And so if you go to my website, uh, there's a languages tab and then the top navigation pane, and we have um, biographical information in English, we got that, um, in Spanish, in um, Chinese, and in Korean right now. And pretty soon we'll have it up in French too. Um, so stuff like that. I want to help with stuff like that, anywhere that I am. Amazing. We are so very proud of you, Kay, and we are all behind you, and I just encourage everyone in this room to, every single vote counts. We had a little meeting again yesterday at the Kimmel Center, and you said, well, the votership is very small, so every single vote is critical. So everybody in this room, we are all just we have a mission and we need to bring our friends and loved ones and uh, just keep spreading the word and get this person of just incredible integrity and the strong moral compass uh, to help lead our community. And uh, so I, I just want to say that I will quickly play something, but I just wanted to mention the 
auction yes. little item we have. And um, I too am campaigning here for the orchestra. <laughs> and so um, we have this wonderful four tickets uh, and come to the orchestra. And I'm sure many of you have been. Um, I know actually for a fact that many of you have been. But that access to the concertmaster's dressing room with champagne and chocolate is fun. And there might even be a little bourbon involved, a little I do it occasionally and it's really fun. And so um, we have our auction bids closing in about 20 minutes. And then five minutes after that, we're gonna announce the winner. And I hope you'll all stay. Kay and I are gonna be here. We wanna eat all this food, this wonderful spread, all this good booze, let's, let's do it. Let's stay and have a little bit of fun. And, uh, but I do hope that you'll all support the campaign through this one auction item. And I look forward to whoever wins, come find me. I'll be the guy next to the kimbap over there. <laughs> and we will uh, exchange contact information. It's so easy. And you can just go on the Philadelphia Orchestra website. The, the basic season starts in September and goes all the way. It's basically like the school year. And then you can pick a concert that you'd like to go to. And um, I'll take care of the tickets. And then it's just a, it's a special evening. And you go out to dinner beforehand and then meet me after the concert. It's fun. So let me go grab my fiddle and pay my have a couple more words. <laughs> David. Well, let's give a round of applause to David. Super excited. <laughs> vacancies? Right. There are 10 vacancies. In Philadelphia, there are about 100 judges. Yeah. Which is why um, there, there is a separation of different types of, of law that is heard um, in, in different traditions. Here he is. going to play a short work for you. This is a piece called Wretched Tivo and Scherzo. And I don't need this. Wretched Tivo um, is just basically like spoken dialogue through the music. It's slow. It's kind of sad. And then uh, the rest of the piece is Scherzo. And Scherzo is uh, virtuosic and fast and flashy. And the whole piece is about four minutes long. It was written by a famous Austrian composer, composer slash virtuoso violinist named Fritz Kreisler. He was from Austria, and he died in the 1960s uh, here in the States. But he left all violinists a great treasure trove of what we call show pieces, short pieces that are virtuosic and like like the recitivo and scared so. So I do hope you enjoy it. This is. Um, a J.B. Guadagnini made in 1757 in Milan, Italy. It's owned by the Philadelphia Orchestra. I get to use it as long as I'm in the orchestra. And it really is insured at three and a half million dollars. They're all like that. They're all very, quite expensive. But um, it's one of the great perks of the job. <laughs> Thank you. 
my late mother, uh, she died in 2019, and she loved classical music. And they, she saw the orchestra many times and was very proud to see a Korean American on stage as the leader of the orchestra, essentially. Um, and she used to say, I know that there is God when I hear music. So I think we know that there is God because we heard the music. So thank you, David. So I had some Korean tears um, hearing about Kay. And I think that what we all know is that Kay is exactly the kind of person you want watching over us in the judiciary. We know she's going to fight for us. We know she's going to work really hard for, for us. But most importantly, we know that she will care about us. And the thing about democracy is, it doesn't just happen. We have to participate in it. We have to be part of it. And by you being here tonight, you are part of this great process of democracy that makes this country a great country. So I want to thank you for being here. Secondly, I want to say it also takes money <laughs> for Kay to be on this stage and to be trying to get this office as an elected official. And so every, as much as every vote counts, every dollar matters for Kay to be able to do the work she needs to do to be elected. So thank you again for the dollars that you've given and go out there and recruit those votes and those dollars so that we can see the kind of democracy that we, we know is promised us, but is not guaranteed without our participation. And finally, I will say, some of you may say, well, I don't live in Philadelphia. So it doesn't really matter. It does matter because as a human race, the least of us, when they are benefited, when somebody fights for their rights, then all of us are also elevated. So thank you for being here tonight. Continue to support candidates like Kay. Continue to support Kay. Um, and um, please, please don't forget that our democracy is very special and precious and will not happen without us. So with that, I thank you for being here. I will also say that the people that the host committee, I want to thank the host committee. I want to thank Cassie and everybody else who's participated in this event. And we do want a picture, by the way, um, so please come up here from the host committee. Um, and everybody. Oh, I'm sorry, everybody. Let's Great have everybody. picture. Great picture. picture. So everybody everyone. up on the stage um, for Seriously. a picture moment, because history could be made here. You can say that you were here before Kay became the next judge. So please come here. Thank you. I'm really serious. This is like a Korean thing. It's like everyone who's in the room, come on up and we're going to take a photo. We're going to take a photo. Are there going to be some folks in here?